Hey, and welcome to the fifth installment of Pod Stallions, the Plaid Stallions podcast. As always, I'm Brian, and with me is Jason. Hello, everybody. And we've got a pretty good show this time, and it's one that is very topical, yet not topical at all, and that is superheroes uh, on the small and silver screen. And we live in an age right now where that's a really common thing, but uh, let's talk about when we were starving, and that would be the 1970s. Yeah, this is another fun one that, uh, just like uh, the Spy one and a few others uh, we've done, where we can find some really cool parallels to what's going on right now. I, I keep saying this. Um, I, I say it on the Geek Shell Inherit podcast. I say it to whoever will listen. For better or worse, I truly feel like we're living in a golden age of pop culture and genre stuff right now, whether it's toys, you know, any any action figure or, or uh, pro, uh, you know, property you can think of has been licensed and made into a toy. And up and down the dial on television and in the theaters, we're, we're really being spoiled with the number of superhero and sci-fi, fantasy, horror, you know, uh, time travel, you name it, uh, amount of stuff that we're, we're getting. We're just getting a, a real wealth of, of stuff. And um, it got us thinking about, here we are, it's another summer. I'm about to see Man of Steel tomorrow morning. Um, Wolverine is coming out, another superhero movie. Uh, we've already had Iron Man 3, um, I suppose, this summer. That was March, I guess, whatever it was. And um, it got us to thinking about our youths, our growing up, our childhoods, and what we had to choose from. And what yeah. we dreamt of, actually. And what we dreamt of, ab- absolutely. Like when uh, I was a kid, or not when I was a kid, sorry, last year, seeing... <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm still a kid at heart and an idiot. Um, last year, when when Iron Man flew down in the Avengers and blasted into Cap Shield and Cap did that thing uh, in the the final scenes of the Avengers, I was like, I have waited, you know, 35 years to see this. Yeah. And I I you know I thought it was brilliant. And then you think about what we had to go on when we were kids and how, yeah. how we, you know, I don't know about you and, and we'll get into this, but I owe my love of superheroes, not because of comics. TV was the gateway to comics for me. Yeah. That's a, that's a really interesting question because I, I don't know if I can pinpoint, I'm sure television came first and that, I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't have understood having seen it on television first. I certainly wouldn't have understood that the comic came first, but I think that, I made my way over to the the comic rack at the supermarket because of the, the TV stuff. Uh, but back to what you just said. That's such a great um, summing up, such a great observation about, you know, a moment in the Avengers or whatever. I mean, I can I can pick a moment from each of the superhero movies we've been given for better or worse and go, oh, that makes me think of this. You know, when it works, you can pinpoint those, those moments. I have something similar. Mm-hmm. Um, not superheroes, really, not comic book, really, but from John Carter, uh, or as I like to call it, John Carter of Mars, um, which is what it should have been. There's a moment <laughs> when he uh, when he first sees uh, Dejah Thoris, uh, the princess. Right. He sees her from another ship, and because he's got the super jumping ability, which, let's be honest, I mean, it, John Carter and, and Burroughs' you know character was a huge influence uh, on Siegel the and comic Schuster. Book. and Siegel and Schuster. It's, yeah. It's true. Um, he jumps up. Uh, there are two moments. There's one where he jumps up and 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 grabs her from a fall and lands and like puts her down. And he's got uh, manacles on, shackles still on his his ankles and his his wrists and big chains. Puts her down, and they have this little moment. And he grabs a sword and goes to fight. And the other moment is when um, he takes on all the warhoon. All the uh, those those mutant tharks. Oh yeah, and he's just slicing and dicing, and they're 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 juxtaposing it with him burying his his uh, wife and child uh, back home, and all those moments where he's just jumping and slicing and the swords, whatever. And I'm looking at it, going, "Oh my god!" Like th- these are the paperback covers that I would you know from my brother's bookshelf that I would just stare at for. 
for days and just 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 study the covers of these books um, to to know John Carter and all the creatures. And that that moment is like I am seven or eight years old. Yeah, looking at those book covers, and they managed to get it into into the film. So I love it that we get. We get stuff like that. Um, we're, we're 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 especially pampered. I think you and I are both agreed on that uh, these days, anyways, and catered to. Absolutely. But why don't we go back to the beginning when we weren't catered to? Well, I was thinking about this in, yep. in preparation. As you know, I do a week and a half uh, rehearsal and preparation for each show we do. That's very physical too, isn't it? Very physical. Uh, yeah. A huge uh, training regimen. Yeah. And um, you know, I put I put on a an off Broadway production of of each episode. But you're still not getting over the wall. Still not, still not getting over the wall. But I keep trying. I keep getting back on the horse. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about this. Mm -hmm. What what might have been that first sort of moment? And I, I'm not sure specifically what it was, but I'd be willing to bet. It was a combination of the Super Friends cartoon or, or, or some iteration of the DC characters in, in a group on Saturday mornings. Yeah, it could have been those old Filmation uh, Justice League tunes, I guess, too. Could have been those, yeah. yeah. Um, but I think maybe I would put my money on live-action Spider-Man in the children's show The Electric Company. Yeah, that's your, yeah, that's your first? In the mid seventies, I think it might be. I think it might be. Like my, I, I remember being. I, I know that I was aware of Spider Man. Yeah. For that, because when it when he popped into the show, I I stopped whatever I was doing. I mean, I I I it got to a point where I was only watching the show in hopes of a Spider Man short being, and it was always toward the end. Yeah, and it was always disappointing. Yet you came back every single time. He's always every like time. fighting Hector Elizondo with. Um, spaghetti strainers on his eyes, pretending to be a fly or something, you know. Um, yeah, and it had that amazing theme tune. Yeah, like, and 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 that I, I I was the same way. In fact, I watched Electric Company till far past I should have been watching it. The sell by date, just because. Yeah, yeah, like you are far too old for this because of the Spider Man segments. Yeah, they because were, they, they were, were the first thing you ever saw that had a live action superhero in it. And you know, um, going back to it. Not not bad. I mean, it's actually a pretty good depiction of Spider-Man. If that was our first, um, you know, in uniform uh, version of the character, it, it 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 wasn't bad. I always got hung up on the fact that he never spoke. That bothered me. Yeah, that point. Um, yeah. But I think that that would be closely followed by, or in conjunction with the '66 '67 Batman. Uh, TV series with Adam West and Burt Ward. Of course, everybody knows that show. The whole world has seen it. Um, but that was something that I, I seem to recall being repeated like on Saturday or Sunday afternoons with, you know, something like the monkeys, they would, they would re rerun it on the local station uh -huh. um, in syndication. <clears throat> and um, so I was a, I was a big live action Batman freak too. So it, it really became Batman and Spider-Man were my two, my two guys. Those are my two main heroes. I, I'm the uh, freak in that. I my parents didn't believe in a converter, so I couldn't get the UHF channels from Buffalo. Buffalo twenty nine played Batman. Okay. I saw Batman a total of three times as a kid. Once really? is, once when they played the movie and the other two times is when I went to somebody's house. And they, they would have one of those big old I don't know if you had these converters. They look like a box, and they had these nondescript buttons on it yeah, and with a so. long wire. I love that those things. But, um, but, but wait a second, you didn't? Um, they they didn't run Batman in Canada in syndication. They, they well, I only got. I think I've explained before that my parents were not the hugest TV fans. Yes, we, we had basic cable, which meant. There, you know, they plugged the cable into the back of the TV, and we got channels two to thirteen. Channel thirteen was in French. Channel ten was basically nothing, um, you know. So, uh, yeah, the, 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 I think another channel played Batman, but I always missed it. I don't, I don't know. I just, I saw the Adam West Batman three times. I remember them vividly. I will say this though, I was aware of it because in '75 I got the Viewmaster reels for Christmas. 
Oh, I had those too. And I burned a hole in those because I was like, is Robin wearing pantyhose? Like they, it was seeing the superheroes as real people. It drove me mad, you know, that I hadn't actually seen the show. And it's, it's funny that you say that because I had a similar experience with, and now we're talking about, cause we, we knew we were going to get to this point in, in the show talking about the stuff that existed before we were born, mm. but we eventually got exposed to, um, so now, you know, we're at a point where we're getting some live action stuff, but the Super Friends cartoon is is a Saturday morning staple. I mean, oh, it yeah. was it was every Saturday morning for me, uh, along with the, the Looney Tunes. You know, I had I had I literally as a you know, as a little kid would write down the channels and go on channel four. We've got you know Looney Tunes from seven to eight. Flip over to eleven, you know, for Tarzan. You know, that, that beautiful, brilliant Filmation Tarzan series that I just friggin' loved. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, the, the Super Friends stuff. But what was lacking were the, the Marvel characters. And at that point, I think as a, you know, six, seven, eight-year-old, well, six, let's go five, six years old probably. Yeah, because, yeah I was going to say, I remember um, this, the, the first wave of Super Friends from being like four, you know, uh, the, with the Wendy and Marvin years. Yeah, it had to be because they had a big time, impact. By the time the Incredible Hulk got on the air, it was seventy-seven. Yeah, I was well aware of who the Hulk was. So I had to. We're going back. I must have been four, five, six years old. And what was lacking in my mind were were Marvel uh, characters. And when I discovered the sixty-seven animated Spider-Man series, that suddenly became. I, I thought it was a new show. I didn't know that it was from sixty-seven. <laughs> So I thought it was new, and suddenly it was airing every day at, you know, three in the afternoon or something. Yeah. And I was just religious. I mean, I, I watched it every single day. That That's that's where we're different. That show is co-produced in Canada. And really? We have, yeah, the, the voice actors, um, Paul Souls, Paul Kligman, um, uh, Carl Bannis, the guy who did the Scorpions voice, he was the DJ on my mom's radio station. Come on! Uh, he, he would he would actually it was a light rock station. He would read his own poetry. Um, Come on! Yeah, they're they're all Canadians. Um, That's awesome. Because they would use the CBC Radio Theater Group, and um, it wasn't uncommon to see Paul Souls walking downtown Toronto back in the day. And he was also the voice of Hermie, the elf who wanted to be the dentist. Get out! Yeah. Um, that's awesome. That's he, totally awesome. He not, wouldn't be any relation to PJ Souls, would he? None at all. Oh. And, and I'm just going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, that show aired because it, we have something called CanCon laws, which means you have to have Canadian content. That filled out under Canadian content laws, as did another show called Rocket Robin Hood. And I'm actually going to do a callback to this later on in the episode. But Rocket Robin Hood had the same voice cast. Rocket Robin Hood? Yeah. Should I know that? No. Um, I shouldn't, but it was a Canadian staple. Okay. Uh, I own original animation cells. If anyone wants to nice. be impressed, the the, um, the 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 center of that is Rocket Robin Hood in the future. Or, okay. Sorry, just regular Robin Hood in the future. But the um, this is a thing that Canadians know, Americans don't know. Um, well, smart Americans do. They got so behind in production of Spider Man and Rocket Robin Hood that they combined episodes. So there's episodes of Spider-Man that are actually Rocket Robin Hood episodes. Um, the so most, wait, the, the characters, the characters they cross just over? just swapped out the characters. Oh, my. Uh, there's even one where Spidey borrows Rocket Robin Hood's spaceship to go to an island, which is supposed to be a planet. But the most famous one, and maybe this is one kids remember, is remember Spidey goes to Dementia, Dementia 5, and he fights this kind of crab guy named Infinata? No, I, I remember Aunt May getting dementia, but yeah, I, I yeah, no, uh, no, no, different no, no, uh, no. Anyways, it's a famous Spidey where he helps an alien, <laughs> and it is it is a Rocket Robin Hood episode. They just swapped Spidey into it. That's kind of fantastic. It, it really is, and and it's one of those things that you only really recognize when you're a kid who watches a thousand hours of television, like I did. Yeah, and so. 67 Spidey, God, I hate to think how many hours of that I've watched. Yeah, I've got it. Uh, I've got the complete collection on on DVD. But I'm I'm now so into Batman and Spider Man, uh, especially. Mm -hmm. I'm so obsessive about Spider Man as a five year old. Try meeting them as a kid. 
You got to meet him? I went to Wolko as a kid. That's what's really spawned my whole love of mall appearances. I met Spidey, Captain America, and the Hulk at Wolko when I was five. That's and, awesome. And um, my mom opened the camera and ruined all the film. So, oh, no. Yeah, I still like talk to people who say, oh, I was at that. And I'd like, do you have any photos? Like, I, I'm still – that's why I do what I do at Platt Stones is I really want to see photos of that. I recall the Hulk being a balloon. You're trying to piece – but you know what? That's – all joking aside, that's what's brilliant about Plaid Stallions and, and some of what you've been able to unearth on your site because you, you – it's almost like you're a guy that has a, a, a weak, a mild case of amnesia and, and strangers start filling in some of the blanks because yeah, you'll – You'll get a photo come through, and you're like, "Oh my God, I was at that thing!" Or yeah. that last one of it was a Doctor Who convention in yeah, Canada sure. that you were you were you're in the footage for God's sake. <laughs> That's amazing. But but so okay, so now I'm I'm obsessive compulsive about Spider Man, so bad that I'll never forget. I'm five years old, six years old, and I ask my mother. She remembers this. I ask my mother if I can change my name to Peter. No kidding. No kidding. And she said. She said, well, you can change it when you're older if you really want to. And I immediately felt guilty because I realized, you know, she, she named me. Yeah. I'm kind of, that was kind of a jerk move to – and I, you know, nothing personal, Ma. I love my name, but I'd rather be Peter. I, I wanted to change my name to Peter. Um, so that, now That's it's, devotion, sir. So as if the world couldn't get any better, you've got Electric Company – uh, you know, maybe every other episode or whatever it was. We've got a tie-in comic book that Marvel ended up putting out, um, which I read a lot of. Which I I managed to find as a kid, and and uh, you know I even had some issues uh, ten twelve years ago that I've lost. Um, something starts to happen, and you know I didn't really notice this until I was you know eight nine years old, and actually was reading. Stan's soapbox and was was piecing together what little I could from uh, Stan Lee's uh, hyperbole in the back of the <laughs> comics. I never read that stuff. He was just – I mean I've got a whole book. They, they eventually put those out in one volume. Really? All of Stan's soapbox and it's just brilliant reading. I just love it because he was – such a, a, a pitch man, you know, like he just – whatever it was, it was going to be the greatest thing that the world had ever seen and Marvel was about to do it. And so he was always talking in the back of the comic about what was coming next, where, you know, where I'm, I've been spending my time in Hollywood trying to get the Fantastic Four animated series, blah, blah, blah. He was a cheerleader. He was a huge cheerleader. And so you knew that, that stuff was happening. So that might have been the first place I – Maybe I'm being romantic about this, and I was too young to. And I'm, I'm, you know, having um, uh, selective memory, but reading about a live-action Spider-Man TV series on CBS. So what happened? What must have happened was, and I could be wrong, and you may know this uh, better than me. What must have happened is, at some point, um, Marvel must have made some kind of a deal with CBS for their characters or some of their characters because uh, you know I'm going to get the timeline wrong but I think I think the incredible hulk was 1977 it was the first and I think it was it was the was it the first one for sure it was the first one now now you you uh, you glossed over two things that I will get will get hate mail about eh which Wonder is Woman? Shazam yeah uh which filmation Shazam which was right. highly influential on me and I loved um, so so filmation Filmation, for those of you that don't know, uh, they – when did they – They they, the they, began, that... they actually started the, – I just read the Filmation book, the brilliant Andy Mangles, Tomorrow's Press Filmation book that everyone should buy. Um, yeah. uh, they, um, they started because of Superman. They, so the, the DC they, – they wanted to get the Superman cartoon contract. Yep. They were fledgling. They brought in a whole bunch of family and friends to pretend they had an animation studio. Okay. And DC walked in and walked out. But I think I think the the famous the famous uh, anecdote is somebody went up to um, to uh, the filmation president Lou Scheimer and said, "I got to go for a dentist appointment." And it wasn't even a real animator; it was just a guy he knew. And he goes, "Okay." And Scheimer turned to his guy and said, "Doc, that son of a bitch." And it impressed the DC people. 
but he wow. was such a hard ass that they gave wow. him the gig. So yeah, they, he had a long history with DC. Which is and, funny because Scheimer, and I, I only met him once, but I met him at Comic Con a couple years ago. But he does seem to have that reputation of being a very very sweet man. Oh my gosh, what what a lovely guy! Um, and 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 was uh, people that to this day talk about what it was like working under him and what a, what a nice guy he was. So okay, so but Filmation existed as as an animation studio. They got into live action stuff. I'm yep. going to say early 70s, '70s. Early '70s, I think I think Shazam would have been one of their. Um, Earliest projects and one of their most successful. And okay, so Shazam. Now wait a second. Shazam is at that point it's a DC character, correct? Yeah, DC had just revived it. Um, okay, so in comics maybe two years previous, maybe three so, years. So they've got Shazam going on. So in the Marvel world, we've got um, the Incredible Hulk live action series, and we'll get to that because the the impact of that show cannot be overstated. Like no. it it. it We'll get to that in a second, but Hulk was first, and Spider-Man. I, I, I'm almost positive they were simultaneous at one point. They, they were, came were, out in both. They both came out in '77. What I think you're getting wrong, and I could be wrong, is I think I'm positive because I'm I'm going on a grade two thing. I think Hulk was like a mid-season thing. Okay. Like they no they, no, they no, launched, no no they did those I, movies. That was I, it. I think it might be just the opposite. I think you're right, but I think. I don't think Spidey got like a full season commitment the way the Hulk did. No, Spidey Spidey was a bunch of um, irregularly programmed TV movies up until 1979. Okay, so so that's happening, and then in the DC corner, you've got live action Shazam happening on Saturday mornings, and we'll get to that in one second. And then you'll know this much better than me, I'm sure. When did the Wonder Woman? Because Wonder Woman, there was a telefilm with Kathy Lee Crosby. Yeah, that was an early '70s thing with, uh, with Kathy Lee Crosby, and they were, they were aping. Uh, if you do, you, like, I don't know how your your knowledge of Wonder Woman is, but for a long time they took away her powers and made her kind of an Emma Peel character. Well, there's the. Have you ever seen the the pilot that was done that was they tried to do around the same time as the the original Batman series? Yeah, I try to not think about it, but yes. Okay, so there was that, which was very. Camp. ridiculous and camp and comedic yeah um and then in the early 70s see i'm not sure i've ever seen oh you the, haven't seen the, the kathy Lee crosby I've, I've seen it i'm not sure i've seen it all the way through she doesn't have any powers and that's they were kind of going for that emma peel and it was very very kind of broadly based on wonder woman um and you she, know was it was it um sorry to, to interrupt was it present day or did it was it wartime it was present day okay because when it came back they, they got more true to the character, and they said it in a period piece. Yeah, they made the first season was a was a period piece with Linda yeah. Carlin, right? And that yeah. was what seventy five. Seventy five. Yeah, yeah. Linda Carter, the Wonder Woman was seventy five. Seventy five. Okay, well, so and then it returned. It, it came. It came November seventy five, and then it came back and as a like I, I don't know if it started as a movie. Again, I think there was a TV movie, and then it, it premiered, the show premiered in 76. Okay, so 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 DC, they really were leading the way. I mean, they were they, cooking with gas, yeah. Right, so, they were, so they're doing that, and Marvel's trying to catch up, and they've got a couple of um, TV series going. So, so Wonder Woman is a hit. It's a mild hit, but it's, uh-huh. it's a hit. And she's obviously a huge sex symbol um, for the dads and the boys and... Uh, role model for the little girls and women or whatever. Um, but it was a big show. And it was – I think that the theme – brilliant, brilliant theme song, that, that brilliant Wonder Woman theme song. The theme song is, is I think, campier than everything that was ever in the series. Like the series had camp moments and silly moments, of course. But I don't think it was ever as silly as that theme tune. You know what though? Now I can't get it out of my head, so it's a testament to it. The the theme tune? Yeah, a lot of these shows had super memorable theme tunes back then. Oh, did you happen to notice um there was a Brave and Bold episode? Yeah, they, they used it. It was oh. genius, yeah. Genius. Yeah, I loved uh, it. So that so that that thing is going and it's and it's pretty big. But the Hulk comes around and this and and this is not you know, Lindsay doing, you know, hours of research. This is purely my observation and memories of childhood and everything else. 
I really think the Hulk uh, TV series, that Bill Bixby, moody, um, fugitive-like TV series, did more for the comic book world um, as far as you know, transferring the characters or the ideas to live action than, than anything that, it, that had come along before it because it took it more seriously than anything we'd ever seen. It really did, like, uh, Kenneth Johnson did that, who also kind of retooled the $6 million man to a success concept. And, and he and later he, did V. And, and Man from Atlantis, right, or no? No. Um, and he did, he, he took it, he made it very serious. Now, originally I've read that he wanted to make the Hulk red because he thought it made more sense, but, you know, he kept it green at the behest of probably Marvel. Okay. The, the, you know, I think they, I think CBS bought four characters. I think they bought um, Human Torch, Captain America, Spider-Man, and the Hulk, and they offered Johnson the Hulk, and he took it. I, I watched the DVD a while ago. And, yeah, he made it very... He, he managed to make it a down-to-earth show. It's basically a retelling of The Fugitive. But you, right. you watched that pilot movie with Bixby again, and it's excellent. Like, it it's still fantastic. holds up as great television. It's fantastic. Now, let's back up two inches. Uh, uh, Lou Ferrigno was not the first uh, choice to play the Hulk, correct? No, it was Richard Keel, and I think they even shot some footage with him. What a terrible idea. What a terrible, terrible – imagine – that alternate universe and yeah. where that would have gone had had he gotten the the part. But it is it is a very um, it's a, it's a heavy show. I mean, it's got silliness and it's very dated and the effects and everything. But I was obsessed. Like if I loved Spider Man and Batman, once I got to that Hulk TV series, and it always made me kind of sad, even as a little kid. Oh like, yeah, it was moody and it was effective. It was moody. They, they were not happy endings at the end. And you thought, when is this guy going to you know, catch a break, for crying out loud? It, yeah. was, um, it, w- it was a heavy show, but it, I was absolutely obsessed with that show. I mean, and, I watched it week in and week out. I have some insider information on merchandise on that because I used to be friends with the late Neil Cublin of Mego. And one of the things he told me was they had made a Hulk doll before the show premiered, and it didn't sell worth of beans. And the minute that show premiered, Mego started selling Hulk dolls on their own, like whole cases of them. Okay. They couldn't keep them in stock. And he became, like, you know, every bit of Mego merchandising of superheroes used to show Spider-Man and Captain America's head. And by the end of the 70s, Captain America was no longer on, you know, no longer the A-list. It was the big four now, and it was, all the merchandise was Spider-Man Hulk. Right. Because, you know, the Hulk just became this superstar. That TV show really propelled him to the A-list. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I would say that um, at this same time, the way, the way Superman, and maybe to a lesser extent Batman, but especially Superman, really was the, the face of DC. Yeah. Uh, Spider-Man is very much the face of Marvel. Without I mean, a doubt. I'm not sure it was that... That was the case necessarily in the 60s, but once you got to the 70s, Spidey became like the Mickey Mouse. He was synonymous with, oh, with yeah. Marvel, so he was he was the toppermost. Um, so this Hulk show, uh, we got it from what 77 to was it 81 or so? I I think I think you're right. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm by the way I should mention that 82 is when it ended, but you know that was the 81 82 season. By the yeah. way, we're both kind of picking through a book that you should pick up called Age of TV Heroes. Yes. It's by Jason Hofus and George Corey. I actually know Jason a little bit. It's brilliant. Brilliant book. Great and it book. really it, really does go into fantastic detail about this stuff. So it, it covers everything from yeah. You know, um, uh, the Flash, you know, DC series that was done in the, in the, in the 90s, mm-hmm. um, all the live action stuff from the 60s. It's got a beautiful cover done by my pal Alex Ross with George Reeves and Adam West and Linda Carter and uh, blah, blah, uh, Bostwick uh, playing Shazam in the cover. You know, you just want to bring this up because it, it's an anecdote. Do you remember the George Reeves show as a kid? Was that syndicated in your area? Yeah, I, I never was into it. I never, it never looked like, to me, even as a kid, and I, 
as I got a little older, I really started to fall in love with black and white movies. But as a, as a, as a little kid, it, it might as well have been cave paintings. Now, I when I was four years old, I can remember going, he's just behind a movie screen. Like, I never <laughs> bought into it. I was just too jaded by this point. I could watch Shazam yeah. and buy into that. But the, the George, I liked it. I watched it every day. But, I, you know, I never believed um, George Reeves was flying. And and I, I was very quick to cop to the thing that he would duck when a gun got thrown at him. Yes. <laughs> I was like, hey. Yeah, I never I never got into that, that show, really. But something extraordinary starts to happen because the Hulk is such a hit. And, by the way, you know, I, I mean, again, I, I'm not sure exactly who our audience is. But just as a refresher, in, in, in the U.S., we got three networks. You know, it's, it's, it's ABC, CBS, and NBC, and then the fourth channel that you get in is... The Dumont. All the syndicated stuff. So, you know, when I say it was a hit show, you know, it wasn't like... It, I don't think it was a top five show throughout its lifetime, but I always make this, uh, this analogy, too. Like, Rockford Files, my favorite show of the 70s, hands down. Um, I think Rockford Files only broke the top 20 a handful of times, but it was on the air from 75 to 81. It, it was nominated and won Emmy awards and golden globes and all that stuff. Um, so you could have had a show like the Hulk and it, it would have been a, a moderate hit for X number of years and wasn't necessarily, you know, dynasty or something. But, you know, Uh, I think it brought in the kids, the young viewers. I think, I think the, I don't, I don't have the ratings of the show, but I think it was actually a hit for the first couple of years. Yes, absolutely. It was big, and and Ferrigno was everywhere. He made the all the talk show rounds and cover a TV guide, cover a TV guide, and and all that stuff. So with the success of that, CBS is going. What else can we do? What else? What else you got? And, well, they had the properties by that point, right? So they then put into um, production a Captain America TV Actually, movie. Well, Spidey first. Well, Spidey. So we talked about yeah. So Spidey was a limited series, and that was that was on the air. I think end of the day that ended up only being like ten or twelve episodes total. I well, think. Well, I think it's a bunch of TV movies, and then they did some episodic television. There's and... actually an episode of the Spidey live action show with what's her name, uh, Isis, the woman who played Isis. Oh, Joanna Cameron. Now, that's a two parter, I think. Yeah. Yeah, she's in that. Yeah, there, there's a, there's a bunch of stuff in there. I think Harold, you would like this. Harold Sakata Odd Job is a villain in one. Oh yeah. Um, I I, go, lo- I the, love personally. I love that show. I, I think back, Spidey um, with the uh, the web shooters on the external looks really cool. You know what? When you go back and look at this show, um, for what they could get away with, for what was natural for them to have done effects wise. And for the character, and the censors were poking on that violence too. I'll bet you anything because oh yeah, because it was very cartoony. Yes, but there was some really groundbreaking stuff going on with him, you know, climbing buildings, you know, swinging around. Like they did the best they could with with what they what they could utilize at the time for Spider Man. And they, I yeah, I love the the uh, the big clunky bracelet web shooter things, and um, you know the outfit and. Uh, he was played by a guy called Nicholas Hammond, yep. uh, trivia buffs, who was also one of the Von Trapp kids in uh, Sound of Music. That's he was the that's... oldest Von Trapp. So, um, so this is where it gets, starts to get hinky, is the Captain America, the first Captain America TV movie. I'm a huge fan of this character. I know you are. I, I, it's, it's so... I Those remember movies are so Hyler. They've got Hyler written all over them. They do actually. Um, I remember where, where I was when that played the first one, um, and you know the, 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 the first like uh, how to start. First of all, they they were trying way too hard to copy the six million dollar man. Uh, okay. Oh yes. Uh, template. He, was... he would make a noise when he used his powers, like a doodle doodle doodle. Uh, I will. I, I will find that noise and I will play it right here. Now, okay, before we even get to that, let's go back another step because I forgot something else. Yeah. Trivia buffs for the Incredible Hulk, and then we'll get off uh, the yep. Hulk for a bit. Uh, in the comic book, the Hulk's alter ego, uh, the main fella, was called Dr. Bruce Banner. 
another one of those alliterative um, names that Stan Lee came up with, like Maybe. Matt Murdock and well, he um, could remember him. Reed Richards. He didn't. Have, Stan Lee was not in possession of a pen. No, <laughs> or an eraser. Yeah. Um, so, so they changed uh, his name for the television series from Bruce Banner to David Banner. You know why? Well, I was going to tell you what I had read was Stan Lee's explanation as to why. And I believe this is either in a Stan's soapbox or it's in the introduction to a collected volume from 1978, which was one half of my birthday present from my dad. The other half of that present was the um, oh, arc, Japanese arc die cast of um, Baltan. Oh, cool. Uh, the, one of the greatest birthday gifts in the history of mankind. Uh, the other was the, this, this collected um, trade paperback introduction by Stanley. Because the, the front of the book says, you know, the TV's biggest star kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I believe in that introduction, he explains it, that the executives were nervous because they thought he sounded, the name sounded too gay. Yeah, well, I, that's that's the one I've heard is, you know, the, there was a lot of jokes. And I, I mean, these are far before my days where Brucey and I, you know, they use Brucey as a, right. <laughs> as a, that somehow, I don't, you know, that doesn't seem to have carried on and I'm glad. Um, but it's so, I don't even know where that came from, but it was, it, it probably came from comedy somewhere. But it was a thing in the late seventies where the name Bruce was like, Oh, hello, Bruce. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. became a, a thing for stand up comics and stuff to riff on that name for some reasons. Yeah. So anyway, sorry, came, back especially to especially the seventies being the Bruce Lee era. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, let's get back to uh, Captain America and where you were when you first saw that first TV movie. I had I had relatives from Germany over, and uh, I love these people, and, and I'm happy they're still they're still around. But I can remember just being like mortified at this restaurant, waiting to get home so I could see Captain America the movie. Oh wow! It was so important to me. I oh. love, I, as, even though I'm Canadian, I, and I've mentioned this on the site a bunch of times. I have a real thing for Captain America, and um, that's interesting. I was. I mean, it's interesting to me to to know. I hadn't thought of this. Like, what what? Because you know, his friggin' name is you know Captain America. Yeah, it's a pretty patriotic character. What you as a as a Canadian, what your take was on Cap? Well, I really didn't. I just I loved the shield. I loved his powers and I loved what he stood for, um, and, and and I just kind of liked you know he was flashy and cool. Um, See, I dug it was one of the one of the comics. I only got a handful of comics as a kid that I was kind of regular with, and I don't mean like I followed you know storylines like people do these days. But it was um, one of them was Captain America and the Falcon. I just thought they were the cool. Oh yeah, yeah. I had the Mego dolls and everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now I um, I did get to see the film. It is the first Captain America movie, and I'm, first of all, I'm going to say a trivia in it. The guy playing the, you know, the kind of Oscar Goldman to, you know, Captain America is played by a guy named Len Berman. Okay. And Len Berman used to drive me crazy when I watched the movie, and now I figured it out thanks to IMDb. He's the voice of Rocket Robin Hood. Yeah. Oh, no kidding! Yeah. So oh, that's a that's a trip. Look at that. Um, but look at that. Yeah, it's a callback. But uh, and nice. and I'm pretty sure you know. Um, uh, it, it has a connection because all those guys did those Marvel Comics um, cartoons back in the 60s, too. Um, oh, okay. But that first Captain America movie is a pile of crap. Now, it, is that the one – the second one that they did is Christopher Lee is the villain, correct? I'll get, I'll get to death too soon. Okay. Um, <laughs> so let's go, let's go back here. So we've got, we've got Hulk, uh, 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 David Banner being played by Bill Bixby. Yeah. We've got Nicholas Hammond. Spidey show, Spider which I love. Um, Linda Carter playing Wonder Woman, and we've got a guy called Reb Brown who's, playing Steve Rogers. Yeah, Reb Brown, not a bad actor. I think he gets a lot of um, I think he gets a lot of flack, but I've actually seen him in a. There's a movie called Death of a Soldier where he gives a great performance. He's actually uh, not a bad actor at all. Oh, he's also the um, he's also the the villain in. Oh yeah, he's the he's the bad guy, the douchebag in. Uh... Well, that's funny because both the, I think Heather Menzies is in both Captain America and. S oh yeah, Menzies. Yeah, she's in. Um, she's, and she's married to uh, who was she married? Robert Urich, and she's another Sound of Music. Yeah, 
Wow, yes, we're, get, we're getting all full circle here. Um, mm. But um, the movie, he puts, he doesn't wear the Captain America costume. He wears this kind of like, I'm Team USA gymnast. He And a helmet, right? He, right he, yeah. He, it's a motorcycle. The, the, well, yeah, but it takes like ages for him to get his origin right. Right. And then basically what it is that the villains have a nuclear missile, and at the last ten minutes of the film, he rolls up in his Captain America outfit, jumps on a van, and puts their exhaust <laughs> downward, and the guys stop the van in the end. Well, now and, I don't need to see this. Oh, I'm sorry I ruined... Oh, well, no, you know, I just saved you two hours. Like, I love the 70s and everything I've got the DVDs, because those just came out about a year ago on DVD. That movie stinks. <laughs> that came out in January. I remember even being eight years old and going, at the end of the movie, he puts on the Captain America suit, and you get a scene of him doing that. And you're like, that's it? <laughs> Rip and, off! Yeah, so they, they, I guess it did well. And he had, and also with his shield... It, it was, was his um, windscreen, yes. Well, I always think, uh, you know that, that little cameo that the shield had in Iron Man 2? Yep. When uh, when Robert Downey Jr. is trying to build the new arc reactor thing yep. or whatever it is, and he and Coulson shows up and he says, "Hey, hand me that, will you?" And they use the shield to prop this thing up. It's a clear cap shield, and I just think I'm, I'm probably wrong. I'm sure nobody cared, but I'd like to think that was someone in the prop department winking at the TV movies. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't doubt it because in Captain America, the actual the first Avenger movie, he does use his shield as a windscreen. Yes. For a brief minute. And I really do think that's a little bit of a subtle nod. to the, they, they should have had Reb Brown in that movie. I don't know why they didn't. But. A little, little cameo for Reb? A so the, cameo so the, for Reb. So the first one must have done all right because they, they did a second one. And by the way, these also, and you know this better than me, these I believe got, or one of them, right, got a theatrical release in, the, in Europe? Uh, yeah, they both did. Death Too Soon definitely did. There's actually two cuts of part two. I'm not going to get into it, but there's a TV cut and the <laughs> one that's on video. And I have both um, <laughs> because um, I'm, I'm odd. <laughs> and, didn't um, the, the Spider-Man stuff get released in Europe or Japan too or something? There is a Spider-Man movie poster on my son's wall in his from bedroom. Japan. No, I think this one might be from Italy or oh, – okay. But they, now, yeah, they released several uh, – more than one of the Spidey films got released theatrically, and the, both right. Captain America's got released theatrically, as did Kiss uh, meets the Phantom of the Park. That got some European distribution. You there? Yeah, right. So now we're jumping around, um, and I, I, apologies, but it's just the way our brains work. We get on these little side streets, and things get brought up, and we have to, we have to pick up the ball. Um, something weird is happening in Japan around this same time, in the, in the mid-'70s. There is a Japanese Spider-Man TV series that is a, a licensed show. I mean, it, it had to be licensed through Marvel because the, the outfit is the same and everything. It's by Toei, Toei I believe. And, and they did a live-action Spider-Man with, you know, the, 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 the whole Japanese thing, the works, you know, monsters and giant robots and, and all that jazz. And um, I've only seen bits and pieces of it, but along with it... Uh, was it Poppy or Poppy? Yep. Poppy, a Japanese toy company, made a, a limited toy range for this Japanese Spider-Man TV series, and I had the the doll. I had the was it like an eight inch, ten inch? It's like a ten inch Big Jim kind of doll. It looks like it's based off Big Jim. That, that, that's the amazing difference, right? Is that we didn't get a Nicholas Hammond Spider-Man doll because Mego had the license, and they weren't going to pay extra to get Nicholas Hammond's likeness or or Reb Brown's. Um, but in Japan, they just made stuff based on that wacky show. And isn't that interesting? So, so, so this is where you come in, being the '70s toy expert that you are. So all this stuff is happening, and it's it's remarkable to me that that Mego has Mego, along with you know Fleetwood or whoever else is doing rack toys or whatever's out there. Um, these other toy companies have toy licenses for various items to be made and no one is doing anything to tie into any of these properties that hit uh the television screens i always oh. found that just odd did they, did they just did it was it was it thrown up the flagpole and then people kind of went uh you know don't buy, forget you know, the lightness thing is a headache or or was the notion you know what the stuff that we're putting out is just as good kids won't it won't make a difference whether it's tied into the series or not i i'm not a hundred percent sure 
like I still go back and forth and depends on who I talk to at Migo. I if you if you've picked up the the first issue of Migo Zine, shameless plug. I did. We have the um the Lou Frigno test sculpt that um was supposed to be done for Migo. And why they abandoned it, I think it's probably because they would have had to argue, you know, get a separate license for Frigno's likeness. Um, you know, we're going to get into Superman the movie and Migo kind of released a line of toys for the movie yeah. but yeah. didn't you know yeah. very sneaky um no <laughs> costumes were paid for um and i'm not uh, you know i've talked to i've talked to bill Barron, who was a vice president amigo at the time he's like no we had the rights to the superman movie but i i don't know if he had to pay the salkinds to you know use or they just or it was an aesthetic choice to use the comic looks for the characters it's hard to tell but yeah. they already had the license nobody could take it so you know making a hulk doll and, and i'm sure not a single hulk doll sold wasn't sold because it didn't look like lou ferrigno yes exactly i mean I, i'm sure that they all that stuff and the series they did each other favors before we go well, when we when we wrap up we should probably wrap up with superman so we'll get to that because I remember as a child being utterly confused and just feeling like there was a portion of the movie out there that I didn't see or or oh, I don't know what. But I just remember being thoroughly confused by there being figures of Jor-El and Zod and Luthor and people like that while this movie was out that looked nothing like – the characters and the actors in in the film. It just made absolutely no sense to me. So, um, okay, so we have the first Captain America TV movie. It does well enough to do a second one. Which is a big improvement, the second one. Uh, it is better. I remember that. And it's um, just in the fact that they got the great Christopher Lee as the as the villain. Can't go well, wrong. They yeah. also showed Cap actually being a superhero um a couple of times in the film you know it, it's got more flavor it's got more action it's a little bit knows what it wants to be when it grows up okay um but i guess at the end of the day now here's here's the thing i've heard two rumors i've heard one rumor is you know they just kind of decided against all this superhero stuff or it didn't perform well in the ratings the other thing i've heard and i cry i kind of don't believe it is they um, somebody jokingly referred to CBS as the comic book station. Oh, right. And the president of CBS canceled it all. Now, the only reason I say that that might not be true is that same rumor applies for all those kind of Green Acres and Beverly Hillbillies type shows uh -huh. where I guess in the 60s someone said to the president of CBS, are you the country broadcasting service? That's right. And he he, he apparently, apparently yanked all those um, – I can't remember the guy's name who created all those. I think his name is Paul uh, Henning. Paul Henning shows. Sherwood Schwartz. One of those no, shows. no, Paul Henning. I think his name was. He created yeah. like Green Acres and Petticoat Junction and all those shows. So either that, you know, the president of CBS is an easily bothered man, or you know, it was just overkill. I'm not a hundred percent. But they did get one more out. They did get one more out. That Technically, is... they got two out, and I'll I'll get to that. But let's oh, okay, get to the, the elephant just... in the room. You're going to let me in on something maybe, maybe I don't know. But they yeah. did get one more out that is sort of the forgotten, um, you know, gimpy stepchild <laughs> of the um, – Permed stepchild. Of the, of the Marvel and DC uh, television properties. And that is a 90-minute TV movie slash pilot that, that had all intentions of being a, a, a full-on TV series. For Doctor Strange. Not exactly every kid's favorite hero. No, it's such a strange... I mean, there there must have been other characters in line before Strange yeah. to be made into a TV series. How this happened... Now, here's the thing about it that's, that's wild. Um, uh, what's his name? Um, oh, who's, the, who's the old fellow that's in it? John uh, Mills. John Mills is in it. Jessica Walters. Yep. Better known as... Gangy. Gangi, Gangi Bluth. It's it's, surpri it's it's surreal to see Gangi Bluth as a. Isn't as a, it? Isn't it amazing? And yeah. also, she was great. Did you ever see the original Cape Fear? Oh my God! Yeah, but I didn't. Yeah, know. she was the she was the wife uh, in Cape Fear. Oh. Um, she's in it as uh, Morgan Morgan Le Fay. Is that who, who she is? I believe so. I named my daughter. That's my daughter's middle name is Morgan because of Morgan Le Fay. And an absolute 
block of wood whose voice <laughs> is dubbed throughout the entire thing. Robert Reed. Uh, called Peter Hooten. Yeah. <laughs> Peter Hooten plays Doctor Strange. And the only other thing that I can think is sort of a claim to fame for this guy um, is he was in an episode of um, Night Gallery. Oh, really? Yeah, he was in an episode of Night Gallery. And also he was in the original Inglorious Bastards. Oh, that uh, that Tarantino was inspired by. My sole like, memory of this is I begged my parents to watch it because it was comic based, or I read Stan's soapbox, and I realized like midway through, I don't really know anything about Doctor Strange. I, I've seen him in one panel of one Spider-Man comic I have. Right. And uh, midway through, I think Jessica Walter does an incantation and a demon appears, like a monster, yes. and like a, my Stop dad. It turned off the TV and turned to me and said, you must never pray to the devil. Oh, my gosh. Like, it freaked him out. And it was like, oh, yeah, I was, that was top on my list because, you know, that, I wanted that to happen. Um, <laughs> like, well, I guess I'll just go right to bed then. Yeah. No, he, he turned it back on. But he had, he had to do this kind of moment of, like, you must never pray to the devil. And it's like, well, yeah, okay. That's incredible. Yeah. And it's also incredible because you saw it. When it ran, I, I remember this is one of those hazy, you know, kid memories. I either saw a picture of Peter Hooten as Doctor Strange in the TV guide or in a Marvel publication of some kind. And I knew it was coming on, but I don't think I ever saw it. It wasn't until many years later that it they ran it like on a Sunday afternoon or, or something. And it's I've got it on DVD now just as a completist to want to have all this stuff. Um uh, because we gotta we gotta side we gotta get back to DC in a second because we we haven't hit the tip of the iceberg yet with how weird things got. They go from sublime and serious and some amazing amazingly good writing for for television with the Incredible Hulk, and they go right down the other end of the spectrum. So um, a lot of this stuff just for people to, to to have reference. A lot of this stuff is available on DVD. Like the Incredible Hulk series is available. The sixty seven Spidey. Uh, Wonder Woman. I'm not sure the 77 live action Spider Man is available on. on hey, you got to know a guy who knows a guy. Yeah, you got to uh, know a guy. Not, not. But you know, they did just put out the Captain America telefilms on DVD. Yeah, I'm, hope, a, I'm hopeful for the Hammonds to get on a nice box set yeah, somewhere. That'd be great. And I've got the Strange, you know, as as a as a bootleg. So just when you think it can't get weird enough, <laughs> back on. Um, I think it was ABC or NBC. I, thought, ABC? I think it's NBC who NBC. pulled this one off. And uh, and uh, there is so little information out there, but what little there is, is it's kind of like the Star Wars holiday special. Like, no one really wants to take credit, and no one can explain exactly where the Inception came from. But um, something happens on NBC. Two episodes are made of a show called... What was it called? Legend Legends of the... Legends of the Superheroes. And the, Legends of the Superheroes. The first one is an actual straight-up... I think they're pilots or specials. I'm not 100%. This is a straight-up, you know, um, kind of action comedy adventure. And then the second one is a friar's roast of superheroes. It's a friar's roast. I mean, I can't... I can only imagine... Besides craft service with, you know, M&Ms and carrots and dip and, you know, uh, uh, Coca-Cola, I can only imagine the mountains of cocaine. I was just going to say the cocaine and bad <laughs> ideas that were just, <laughs> I, you know, these guys, it's like they ushered a bus of pr producers that were like Star Wars Holiday Special, Paul Lind Halloween Special. Oh, we got our superheroes now. You know, just these, it is just, it, it makes... I missed it as a kid, by the way, and was I told on the schoolyard it, I had missed the second coming of, you know, and, and I was so angry. I don't remember which one I saw, but I know that I saw it when it aired. And I thought it was kind of cool because this was the first time. Besides, now, first of all, uh, it, it's insane. It's completely it's completely <laughs> mental. It was it's dated totally... in 1979. Like it was 10 it was years old. Yeah. And it's and it's but you see some faces you kind of recognize, like Jeff Altman and some other people here and there. But um, the 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 one saving grace that it has 
Adam West, they managed to get Adam West and Burt Ward. How did they get them? And <laughs> they, they left their job at the mall. They don't make this. So Adam West they quit. and Burt they, they, they took off two boat shows. That's right. They got Adam West, Burt Ward, and Frank Gorshin to come back and uh, play the, the roles that made them famous in the Batman series. Um, both episodes, no one even had the good sense to take 30 seconds and tuck, tuck poor Adam West's cowl under his cape or outfit. And so this cowl is just flapping away on his shoulders throughout. So it's bizarre. So you've got, But the thing is, this was the first time 80, 90% of these characters were ever seen in any live action form. Yep, yep. I mean, this is the first time we saw the Flash, Green Lantern, uh, Hawkman, Hawkman, uh, Ghetto Man, you know. Um, Ghetto Man? Ghetto Ghetto Man Man was one of the, you know, mountain of bad ideas in this thing. Uh, Giganta, the Atom appears in it. Um, Uh, It's Solomon Grundy. Marsha Warfield. Marsha Warfield. I had all her comics. All these characters that we had in some of the Hanna-Barbera super friend, superhero cartoons were brought into live action. So mercifully, they only made two episodes of this show. I was so mad that Charlie Callis didn't get to play Sinestro in the Green Lantern movie. Charlie Callis. Yeah. Yep. The guy, I mean, that, honest that's... to God, next to, next to Senor Wences, can you think of a guy that had a, a longer career based on nothing? Like that's uh, Ray J. Cool. Johnson. Ray J. Johnson, and who's the other guy? Who's the comedian that always gets the words just kind of wrong? Oh, that. You know, he's like a Catskills guy, but he's, I went to the thing, and I said, but, 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 they gotta, I got to go get my probate checked, and the doctor did the, you know, he's that guy. He always gets the words just a little wrong. You know what? It'll come to me. Uh, oh, my God. It's like this Charlie Callis, a, a whole career, just, and I did the, yeah, yeah, Bert, Bert, Bert. Uh, my son, I, I'm going to give you a little personal history. This became my personal quest to find this in my teenage years. I was a little bit comic book obsessed. Um, I bought all these stills I found from a guy who had original photos of it. Finally, I tracked down a copy like in 87. You know, this VHS copy came in. And I watched it. And have you ever been so, how do you put this, so possessed to like something that you like it? Because you've waited, you just don't want to be let down. Yes, um, uh, you know what, Doc Savage. <laughs> it's, well, you, doc, you know what, same thing here. The um, George Powell Doc Savage. I paid, it, I paid like forty dollars for that on on VHS. I remember that. It, <laughs> and the same thing. It's like, huh? Um, but uh, this one is way worse than that one, though. Like you could you could watch the George Powell Doc Savage with the sound off and really enjoy some of those. Oh, songs. George Powell, the Doc Savage movie is is friggin' Lost Horizon. It looks, yeah, it, it looks gorgeous, you know. This one is, is just got so much, um, it's so much uh, well wrong. done. Well, yeah, just so many wrong ideas. And like you said, just, you know, cocaine and failure. Um, <laughs> and just bad, hacky jokes. And Giganta's actually played by uh, a, a transgender. Did you know that? No. Yeah, that's a... Uh, that's, uh, 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 that's that's a man, baby. Is, are uh, you serious? Yeah, I, that's a big. It's a, it's, it's an actor actress uh, Alicia Brevard, who I did was, not know that. Uh, well known for being, you know, because back in the day that was kind of a rare thing. Nowadays, not yeah. so much, you know. Um, but Boy, yeah, I, I didn't know that, and I don't know now but, that not to put too fine a point on it whether I was ever turned on by her watching it. Yeah, so, like, that's uh, it's it's interesting. Not, yeah, and the jury's out on that one for me. But so, so Warner, that's, Archi- yeah. Warner Archive re-released that on DVD, and I have not bought it. Uh, I did. But I told my son about it. <laughs> my son was addicted to it when I was a kid. Or when he was a kid. I, I would put it on, and he was so fascinated. I was asking him about it today in the car, and he's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and um, he went, can we rewatch that? And I was like, oh, I don't I have no idea where that tape is. But he wants me to buy it on DVD so he can watch it again. But it is, it, it, you know, even as a kid, and I, I don't remember knowing or thinking it was bad as a kid, but I can understand that. And I could, I, I understood why as a kid it was attractive to me. Because, I mean, my, let, let's just on paper uh, forget <laughs> – Okay, that's that's hard to do. That's not a that's not a bad analogy. But I'm just saying, 
if you can take away knowing anything about its contents, you're looking at these pictures and you're going, oh my God, it's like, you know, on the weekends they run the Batman live action series and I love that. What if we had all these characters in a show or a, or a TV series? That must be what this thing is going to be. And then it ends up just being, you know, an hour, two hours worth of the most insane television. And I say that as someone that's sampled and remembers a good chunk of 70s insanity in television, like the the Telly Savalas special where he comes out singing at the beginning. Oof, yeah, I, I, I watched enough of the Sonny Bono show. Um, <laughs> yes, exactly. the, the, uh, the whole thing about um, that show is I have no doubt that if I was eight years old and watching that, it would have been one of those scrapbook memories. And, you know, I liked the holiday special as a kid, so... Oh, yeah. Oh, so, totally. Um, I, I have no doubt that it would have been fantastic. And But, you know, and, and I still kind of like it for what it is, because it is kind of now a bit of a train wreck. And, I, you know, look, I, I, I love a train wreck. Um, yeah, I'm a huge a guy for that, so... What's remarkable about a lot of this stuff... Um, what's remarkable about a lot of this stuff to me is, like, this is this is stuff that was aired once, yeah. I mean the fact that the fact that I can proudly say I watched the Star Wars holiday special the night that it aired. Yeah. It only aired once and it was like again it goes back to some of the stuff that you and I have talked about on the show and in private certainly about having to get something or see something, you know, now or when it comes out whatever because you didn't know when you were ever going to get to it or see it again. So a lot of this stuff, I mean, I didn't see Doctor Strange when it aired. I must have missed it whenever that thing was was in, in the listings. You caught it when it aired. I saw the Captain America TV movies when they came on because we were so starved for this stuff. Oh, we, yeah. were, we were, even if it was bad, it was going to be good for us because it was like, oh my gosh, we got a live action, you know, Captain America. Yeah. So, so all this is happening, and in the meantime, there's there's you know <laughs> there's also this this other thing that's going on where we've got the the Saturday morning DC cartoons, which are just seem to be a staple from the time I was born. It just seemed that the Super Friends were on Saturday mornings in one form or another. Do you know they got canceled? In the middle of that, and like, I, I, there's a guy on my message boards who's an expert on the Super Friends, mm. and the, 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 it was actually off the air for a couple of years in the mid '70s. But I never noticed. I never knew that. I yeah. Had, I remember the um, who who are the two kids with the dog? Wendy and Marvin. Wendy and Marvin with was it uh, Mass Wonder Mass- Dog? Wonder Dog. Turn in your cape. Sorry. Was he the one that? Now wasn't there a cartoon though with the dog that? Walked around with a doghouse on its head. That's uh, that's Mighty Man and Yuck. Yeah, whatever cocaine was left from the yeah. Legends of the Superheroes, they gave to that team. To My, Mighty that. Mighty <laughs> Man was like the only superhero with like a big perm, <laughs> and he kind of looked like a dentist. You know, <laughs> so that's all, weird. I was just discussing that with someone else recently. Um, so all this is going on. And Stan, meanwhile, is writing in Stan's soapbox about how Marvel is going to take over the world. Now, not to you know put too fine a point on it, but we've got we've got three networks. Again, this is U.S. I don't know how much got transferred over to, to Canada, but we got three networks. We've got some live action stuff, and at the time, you know, the most natural thing, and even before this live action, the most natural thing to do for any of the Marvel properties, would have been an animated series. It would have made sense because of the, the demographic, the Saturday morning thing, and you know what you could pull off in an animated series, what you could get away with with action and insanity and whatever else that you couldn't with live action. So it was a big deal for Stan to be making all these deals in, um, you know, in Hollywood when he was out in L.A. In the, yeah. in the late 70s to make all these, these animated series. So... I'm watching the 67 Spider-Man <clears throat> on the weekday afternoons. The next animated series um, involving Marvel, and I say this again, Saturday morning belongs to the Super Friends, the DC. They're all covered. They've yep. got, they got that going on. The next big announcement I can think of for Saturday morning cartoons for Marvel 
would have been the Fantastic Four animated series. Yeah, what a letdown that was. And here's another bit of, you know, <clears throat> urban legend or trivia, whatever you want to call it, uh, as anyone that has a surface knowledge of, of the show uh, knows, it was missing a key player. It was missing the human torch in this, this show. Now, you had heard some things about why Johnny Storm was not in the 78 Fantastic Four animated series because the character belonged somewhere else or something? or someone well, else No, had- that's actually I, – I, I can't remember where I read it. I'm going to say it's probably like the back issue or something like that. That's been confirmed. Okay. Because, because there was always that, that BS um, urban legend that, well, they didn't want kids catching on fire. Well, they did it in the 60s. Well, that was, yeah, I, I, and I, again, I could be getting this wrong, but I seem to strongly recall Stan Lee saying something along those lines, that executives were worried about kids, you know, dousing themselves with gasoline or something. Do, do you remember, too, like, not to get on the, that Fantastic Four cartoon was a big disappointment to me, and, and you watch it now, and it's, it's, yeah. it's pretty terrible, along, along with the 70s Spider-Woman cartoon, they, I didn't know what they were doing with that. Well, they gave. Well, the thing is, you watch the Fantastic Four. Um, oh, and just again, you no. Know, in case anyone doesn't know, they. So you've got uh, Sue Storm, Reed Richards, and Ben Grimm as the thing. Uh, you're missing Johnny Storm. In his place, they put a little uh, robot <clears throat> called Herbie. H e r b i e, uh, I believe. Which is an acronym for something. Annoys children. I don't know. <laughs> a terrible voice. Has all these gizmos and, of course, drives Ben Grimm up the wall. Yep. Um, so, so that's going on with Fantastic Four. But um, you, as far as I know, look, I've got uh, Fanta- this Fantastic Four series and Spider-Man and his amazing friends on DVD, but they're Region Two. Oh yeah, they're, they're yeah they're in the UK, I think. Yeah. Yeah, you cannot get these these series in the US. On DVD, I don't know no, why. I'm gonna keep it that way. No, I love Spider-Man: The Amazing. But it's but no that when you watch the Fantastic Four, the animation is atrocious. I've talked about some of the Hanna Barbera stuff before with Super Friends, where there there's a whole sequence of a conversation between Superman and Batman, where Batman's chest emblem is gone. It the, is the, it's, anything that Patty Freely did that wasn't like cartoon animals seemed to be forced and uh, didn't seem to flow right. I mean, no, no detail whatsoever. It no, was- it's it's bad, and and the, and the um, it's it's that start of that hammy acting and overpowering music that a lot of Marvel comic cartoons have, yes, where you can absolutely. barely hear what the people are saying because there's like da na 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 na, you know, going but over top of it. It's one slightly saving grace. Uh, well, two maybe. One that the voice of Ben Grimm is done by uh, Fred Flintstone. Is it Fred Flintstone in that one? Is it Alan Reed? I think it is. I'm pretty sure it is. I, you know, I, I get. I know Ted. I know was it Ted Cassidy did it in the in the '60s one. Yes. And um, Chuck McCann did it in the '90s, which actually was brilliant. Oh yeah, good old Chuck McCann. And uh, who's still alive, by the way? And we're Facebook friends. Oh nice. Uh, and who, who? Oh. Yeah, no, I'm pretty sure that I'm pretty sure that that was um, that was Fred Flintstone, but. When you watch it, you can see – because Jack Kirby worked on it. It got him uh, a fair amount of work you know, uh, with character design and storyboards and such. And you yeah, see, you can see that stuff in there. Yeah, the faces of you know, the, the reporters or whoever's walking around the episode. It's, it's, it's got Kirby written all over it. Ted Cassidy was Ben Grimm on that series. <clears throat> oh, so it was – okay, so it was Ted Cassidy. But see, here's the thing. Ted Cassidy. Now wait a second. Ted Cassidy was Lurch in the Adams Family. The original, and he was Bigfoot, and uh, he was the opening narrator for the Incredible Hulk series. That's right, and he was uh, Harvey, the guy who um, was going to take over uh, Butch Cassidy's gang in Butch and Sundance ah. uh, when Paul Newman fights him and kicks him in the groin. Ah. Yeah. So uh, okay, so I'm getting. I, I thought he. I thought Fred Flintstone did the voice, but Ted Cassidy did the voice of. Um, okay, in the in the pilot of Flash Gordon, that brilliant. He, he's Thun, right? 
he's done in the in the television movie. Yeah, it's awesome. That brilliant television movie that has that opening half hour in you know Berlin or wherever it is during the war. But in the in the TV series, I think it's someone else. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's uh, 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 what's his name? Sam the butcher there. Um, yes, you're right. Exactly. Yeah. Because I think Ted Cassidy passed away. Ted Cassidy died of complications of heart surgery, very minor heart surgery. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it was like 79. So I think he yeah. did that pilot as Thun and then he, he, he passed away. And Alan so, Reed, Fred Flintstone was dead by 77. OK, so I'm I'm and I think I'm getting him mixed up with you know, Sam. You know, you know what? I know what you're you're getting mixed up is you remember the Planet of the Apes cartoon. Yes. The voice of General Urko is done by replacement Fred Flintstone. Uh, oh, okay. I can't remember that guy's name either. I think he's also dead. Is there uh, something wrong with us that we're able to have a conversation that involves the words replacement Fred Flintstone? And, and you know what I'm I talking know about? know what the hell you're talking about? That <laughs> and that I'm mad that I don't know his name? And it's, it's, <laughs> it's it, Henry Corden, by the way. Um, is it time to get out and throw a Frisbee? Is I, it... think, I think it is time to maybe play some football <laughs> or, you know... Um, Go talk to some girls. Um, so, okay. So, Fantastic Four animated series, bad as it was, man, I was there every Saturday morning. So, for that so was I. I watched that terrible <laughs> Godzilla show, too. <laughs> and Godzuki. Yes. Um, and it led to, but it led to what I think is a very underrated animated series. Uh, it's not great. It's got some god-awful things in it. But it was kind of cool for the time with just the number of faces that would pop in to it, and that is Spider-Man and his amazing friends. Yeah, that's an 80s property, but I agree. I love that show. And, yes. and I had I had a thing for Star, uh, Firestar. Yes. I think that was 81. Yeah. So it was right at the tail end, but I feel like... I thought you were going to mention the Ben Grimm Flintstone comedy hour. Oh, my gosh. Sing, ring, do your thing with the schmoo, and, and do you remember that abomination? Well, I remember... I remember how Ben Grimm would, would transform, right? Wouldn't yeah. he, like, become a pile of rocks and then smash it and suddenly he was Ben Grimm? I think he put his thing rings together. Or his thing rings! Yeah. Yeah, like, see, and that's something that I I really, somehow my brain just blocks out. Stan until it, Lee just had a rubber stamp with his signature on it. <laughs> <laughs> okay! He, 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 or he used the same guy that approved Dan Aykroyd's scripts in the 80s, you know? just <laughs> <laughs> All right! Um, the guy that greenlit Vulcan Vania. Oh yeah, okay. um, that was Dan Aykroyd. <laughs> no, but, but yeah, no, it it. Uh, I think I just kind of blocked that out because I mean I remember it and I watched it, but I didn't. That's that's the beauty of YouTube and the flipping internet. I didn't <laughs> remember that thing until YouTube about a year ago when I came across it. Like I'd completely forgotten that 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 series existed. You can see the cells moving in that one. Um, it's, it's God awful. We, we, we're, we're, we're running low on time, but we really have to talk about how the seventies pretty much ended for superhero fandom. And I think it's on a high note. And, and yes, that is, I, that is the movie experience of the seventies other than star Wars. Um, yes, everything we're talking about and we've, we've done this with a purpose is all leading to the climax of, of the 70s, which really is Superman the movie. And that's uh, pretty topical, considering we both have tickets for one right now. That's right. Yeah. That's right. It, uh, Superman the movie, 1978, um, delayed uh, several times uh, for, for various reasons. If anybody um, doesn't have the, the uh, movie on DVD, I urge you to rent it. I don't know which one. Which one to rent? But there's a fantastic documentary uh, that was put together when Christopher Reeve was was still alive and talks to all the principals and Richard Donner about the making of of Superman, the movie. Uh, it's on one of those DVDs. And it's such an extraordinary story because because what um, Richard Donner said, and you, I'm, you know this, I'm sure most of the listeners know this, so I hope I'm not being boring, but the, the, the thing that was utmost importance to Richard Donner was the word verisimilitude. He wanted this to be as serious as The Godfather, that this, if we're going to do this, it has to be taken seriously, and uh, it has to be done right. And we have a lot to thank Richard Donner for with this movie, because when you watch this documentary and you see all the all the roads they could have gone down or how things might have happened. Like oh, yeah. that original 450 page script where 
you know, Superman lands in Metropolis, hit, hits the ground, and Kelly Savalas is standing right there, and he says, who loves you, baby? Uh, that kind of thing that we, we managed to avoid, and we got the, oh. the masterpiece that we, that we did. Um, so that was, that was it, man. I mean, that was like, once that thing hit, everything paled in comparison. Now, it believe like, it or not, I've been talking on my message board about Superman, and, and there's people younger than me saying, uh, you know, it's kind of goofy, and the special effects are kind of silly, and, and you know, I, I, a lot of people are lambasting these younger guys saying, you know, oh, that's a classic, you can't mess with it like that. I think a lot of it is the fact that we were eight years old, and it was the greatest superhero movie ever made at the time. Sure. You know, and, and I love, you know, we're a lot more accepting of superhero lore Mm-hmm. But our parents didn't give a flying, you know, flip. a flip about Superman. He was goofy. Oh. Batman sure. was a guy who did the Batusi. The comics were kid stuff. So to be able to make a film that appealed to both of us as children, be serious, and uh, actually draw in a large audience, because they inflected a bit of humor into it, it was a good movie. It and, is, but, you know, you just you just said it. You said... The best superhero movie to come out and blah blah blah. It, in my mind, it still holds up. I, I, mean, I it, still, I still think it's a top five. It, uh, absolutely, and that's really saying something for, you know, I mean, we're talking 1978, so you know, do the math with just how old this this feature is. Um, that it holds up that well. And of course, it's got some problems, and it's got. Um, you know some stuff that's that's dated yada yada but um it's and, so and, good in so many ways and really and i i always go on and on and on about this uh because people talk about the writing and the design and all this i can't stress enough how much of that falls on to christopher reeves shoulders what a likable performance he, he gives he's he nails superman and i think he kind of helped um, set the tone in comics for the way Superman was to be portrayed for yes, a long time too. We've talked about this before too. Like you know, next to the story of you know Jesus, the story of of Superman is is you know the whole world knows Superman. So he's walking into one of the classic characters in pop culture for for all time, and he he just you know from from the moment you see him. I mean, there is that. I've talked about this on on Shell and Harris, and it's in the trailer. It's in that first uh, or the second main trailer for Superman. Uh, the narration, you know, you've got that final shot of Christopher Reeve in the Fortress of Solitude. He's off in the distance, and he puts that final crystal in, and the narrator says, <clears throat> and I'm not going to do the voice, the narrator says, his name is Kal-El. He will call himself Clark Kent, but the world will know him as Superman. I know. The, the, I, I can just tell by your inflection who that guy is. That I know that voice. As that narration is is playing, he flies toward the camera, and just as he's about at the camera, he he kind of veers off to the right, and you're just like, oh my god, I want to see that right now. I mean, from the moment that's that's and that actually that bit of footage is the first time you see him as Superman in the in the film. So, yes, he plays Clark Kent very big. And, oh, gee, Lois, and uh, blah, 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 You know, and he, he did that damage. Clark Kent was never that goofy in any other iteration of the, of the character. So there was some damage done there for the next however many years of making him quite so goofy. But when you consider... <laughs> when you consider the man was 24 years old... Yeah. When he played this part, it's all the more remarkable to me that that he did what he did, and it's 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 a wonderful movie. I, I probably watch it once a year, and great cast and and writing and music. Of course, the theme is incredible, but uh, you can't stress enough just how incredible Christopher Reeve is in that part. You and, could, the only the only complaints I have about it is, and thanks to fast forward, you don't have to worry about it. Is the credits? You could make muffins during the opening <laughs> credits of that film. Like, my God, even when I was eight, it was like, all right. <laughs> and, I, you know, I, you know, Ed, this is this is now a funny thing with me. I, I, Marlon Brando's contempt 
Like, I've heard on set he was kind of annoying. Even yeah. though he's getting paid all this money, he was like, oh, let me just voice a suitcase. You know, <laughs> I, the super, they don't know what Superman's father looks like. I don't, he could be a suitcase, and I'll just hey. do the voice. Like, he's just a bizarre pest. But he says Krypton. Krypton. I'm from yes. Krypton. <laughs> it's just yeah. like... <laughs> not be aware that Krypton is imminently going... <sighs> He does that thing. And for those of you, again, you know, that um, don't remember or don't know, at the time, at the time in 1978, see, this is how it was all ass backwards with the cell kinds, because they were all about, you know, sign these people up, sign these people up, we'll be fine, we'll get the thing made, but make sure that so-and-so gets on the, they had Hackman and Brando signed on. So they'd already spent, you know, buckets of money on those two guys, and they thought the rest was going to fall into place. The whole universe was was thought of or auditioned uh, as as Superman. I mean, they at one point they wanted Robert Redford. You know what I mean? Uh, before they come to Christopher Reeve. But at the time, Marlon Brando, I believe, was getting paid three million dollars for this picture, and they said it was the most that anyone had been paid uh, versus screen time in the history of Hollywood. Yeah. Because he's only in the movie for you know eight nine minutes or so. And he got like three million bucks and didn't learn any of his lines. They said his lines were taped all over the, the set. He taped it on the baby, I think, too. On the, on the baby. <laughs> Posted and note on his stomach. Um, it's just one of the – there are so many great moments from that movie. But, but again, you know, uh, I, I kind of liken it to, to Batman, too, to Burton's Batman. We got a lot of distance from, from Burton's Batman. And, and uh, that movie has gone from being universally loved – to tepid, to hated, to lukewarm, to, to loved, loved again. Yeah. yeah, true. And I and I go, come on, you know. Again, what was the world that they were walking into with this with this film to make this thing, and how revolutionary, you know, was it what what they did? And with Superman, it, it goes back even further because there was nothing to hold it up against. So it could have gone so horribly wrong in so many horrible different ways uh and it didn't and we end up getting this absolute bona fide classic um and this is a great way to, to, to wrap it up we are both about to see man of steel this new superman film with henry cavill as um uh, jimmy olsen mm -hmm. and um uh when we first saw some of these commercials and trailers i'll admit i was not <clears throat> that excited i mean I like stuff that Zack Snyder's done. I love Watchmen. I'm looking forward to this. But a lot of what I had seen was been there, done that. The I was worried about an hour in Smallville. I really was. Yeah, exactly. Only because, you know, I know I get it. I've done it. I've been there. I move on. Um, the last couple of trailers, man, I am I am buzzing. I mean, I am seeing it tomorrow morning at like 10 a.m. because I cannot get there fast enough. I'm going to see uh, it on Father's Day with my kids. And, oh, that's great. Yeah, that's I might hide out until then, so I don't I don't like things being ruined for me. Um, no, but, I've seen plenty. I've seen enough. I don't want I, when, when Superman Returns came out, my son was just a bit too young. I think he was four. Right. And that movie was just too adult-themed and too dark for him. Like, I didn't right. think he should see Superman getting stabbed in the back, you know. But now, you know, now he's ten, so, uh, you know, he can see it. Um but, and so he's seen has he seen Superman Returns since? No, he never did see it. He didn't. Um, he got some. But what was your? We never, I don't think we've ever really talked about Returns. What was your take on on that? I liked it, but I thought he painted himself into too into a corner. Um, I thought the casting was top notch. Yeah. I just I just kind of thought of all the things to take away from it, it wasn't comedy Lex Luthor and his real estate scams that I would like to base <laughs> the new movie on. I would I really would have liked to have seen a. He had a great template. He had he had everything, you know, all the toys in the sandbox. Just wish he had of um, had Superman punch something, you know, um, fight something. Just you know, had a little bit of more to it than what it was. I, I you know, there was this whole subplot about a child. Oh. I, don't, I don't think that needed to be done. I, I don't hate the film. I, I no, liked I it. And... I don't hate the film. And again, just like the goodwill that's there for. Christopher Reeve, Brandon Routh, I thought was wonderful to to have to to have to step into those shoes. Um, I thought he did a terrific job. I would have liked to have seen him 
continue and do more with the with the part because I thought he did a he did a great job. But again, um, and you and I are uh, differ in opinion a little bit on on Star Trek Into Darkness because uh, I, I think you like it a little more than I do. Again, I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was a, you know a good film. But the problems I have with it, there's a there's a good dozen or so. But one of which is. It didn't know at certain points whether it was being a remake or an homage boot, or an homage. Yeah. And I think that was part of the problem with Superman Returns. I mean, there are yeah. there are whole chunks of dialogue that are lifted directly from the original Superman. It's a little it's a little too borrowed. Um, something borrowed, something blue. Um, <laughs> yes, it is yeah. a little too borrowed. Um, you know, we're we're uh, we're getting back into modern, but you know, I teased something and I wanted to get to it just for the closer because it's it's a perfect way to end because it, it it's seventies and goofy. The fourth, what I believe is the fourth Marvel mo- or fifth Marvel kind of adaptation is is not actually a Marvel character, but it looks like somebody took Iron Man and thought, let's make this for television and okay. let's throw in some Bionic Man. Okay. So it is an abomination. It stars David Aykroyd. It is called Exo Man. I think it's on its entirety in YouTube. Seek it out. Um, but basically what it is, it's got a great <laughs> plot and actually a great idea. Actually, I think it got remade as Mantis, which is, you know, an inventor gets handicapped by bad guys, builds himself an exoskeleton and fights crime. Okay. Um, whatever you think of the canceled 90s series mantis it is christopher nolan's dark the the dark knight compared to what exo man is okay it basically looks like a big orange road cone <clears throat> he, he has a van because every yeah traffic cone he, he he basically has a van because everybody in the 70s got a van sure. and he walks around then you know the the gangsters go, oh, don't hit me, ah, uh, and they like you know jump in front of cars or they hurt themselves. But right. Exo Man never touches them, See, and he's, he's just they're, they're helping they're helping him out a little bit. He looks a bit like a bomb suit, and he's just walking around going <laughs> boop, boop. Well, I saw, I actually sent you some clips uh, today, and I and I, that's the first time I'd seen any footage of this character of the show, so I can't wait to uh, to delve deeper into Exo Man. Was it Exo Man? Is that what's called? Yeah, Ex- Exo Man. Yes, Exo Man. I'll uh, <clears throat> I'll dive deeper into that. In closing, just real quick, mm-hmm. we talked about uh, all this Marvel and and DC stuff and lack of merchandise, lack of original. You know, when you think about it, I mean, gosh, yeah. When you think about it, the the Hulk television series that was seventy seven to eighty one. That's a good chunk of time for a weekly television series. And no tie-ins, no uh, puzzles. Okay, puzzles. puzzles. Probably some viewmasters, but that's uh, British it. annuals with comics. Um, I'm yeah. stretching for other things yeah, now. Nothing, not like a big master toy line or anything. No, no. Um, now Superman, Mego has the has the license again, and for the movie, they, for whatever you know, dozen half dozen reasons are out there. Um, it kind of looks like Christopher Reeve, but kind of not. Yep. And then no one else looks like anybody from the film, but they're all the characters uh, in their comic book uh, outfits. I think Jor-El kind of does look like Marlon Brando. And Jor-El didn't have white hair in the comics. So they did. It's like their heads are just avoiding lawsuits <laughs> to look like them. But then the costumes are just like, you know, Challenge of the Super Friends time, you know, right. and right. and I, I love them. I'm looking at them right now. And they did, of course, three and three quarter inch. And Mego had all kinds of, you know, they were going to recycle all the comic action hero play sets, you know, the Exploding Bridge and yeah. the Fortress they of had, Solitude. They and, did have some plans, right? Yeah, they did. They were going to market it. What I do know is... The people at Mego, there's an interview from like 82 or 81 on licensing, and they say that Superman just didn't sell uh, mm. for Mego. It didn't improve sales. That shocks me. But, you know, well, maybe um, it's because the kids couldn't relate to the product, or maybe it just, you know, Superman, unlike Batman or, you know, Captain Kirk, he doesn't need anything. He has no a very little role play, yeah. you know. And, and that, that's I find the problem that even when Mattel did the Superman Returns line, they don't know what to do with him because he's Superman. You know, he's a he basic needs, guy. He needs a utility belt, though. Yeah. Um, well, that that brings me to two quick things then to wrap it up with, with sure. merchandise. One, we did get 
didn't we sort of get a tie-in uh, Mego uh, line for Wonder Woman for the TV series? Again, if you really look at it, it's classic comic looks. You got well, Nub- the- Nubia, uh, who was from the comics. Yeah. You got Steve Trevor, that doesn't look like Lyle Wagoner. And you got Hippo... Hippo, Hippo I can't do it. Hungry, hungry Hippolyta. Hungry, hungry hippos. But wait, um, wait a minute. Now, didn't but didn't the commercials use the theme tune in the in the TV commercials? I thought. True story. Um, maybe they got away with that, but I know they put Linda Carter's <laughs> on the first run, or Linda Carter's. Oh my stars! Let's read your that. Pardon. Wow. That is Tyler, that is, yeah. this is a family show. Linda Carter's face. What on is the wrong first with boxes. you? You know what? I, I'm gonna you know, we're gonna I'm gonna cut that out because there's no way I'm living that yeah. <laughs> no! That's classic radio, man. I'm really tired. Put the bum line down. <laughs> I actually was drinking a Wells IPA. Um, okay, on that note. <laughs> um, now wait a second, but here, here's my thing. Now there were two I'm, things. You turned me on. Speaking of turning me on, all right. You turned me on to something not long ago, that I was completely unaware of. We did get some official Superman the movie toys, uh, merchandise, action figure, yada, yada, from uh, Spain. Yeah, the, the, model, the model man. Now, it doesn't look like Reeves, but the box is definitely the Superman the movie logo, and it's, um, it's got the Fortress of Solitude behind it. It's definitely inspired by the movie. And there was a, a 12-inch figure. Oh, no, no he's sorry. like six inches tall. Six-inch figure, which I need to get, so yeah. I'm still on the lookout. Anybody out there that's, that loves the show, uh, wants to do me a solid, I'm happy to pay. But I need that figure in the box, speaking of Linda Carter. Um, and also, they also did – didn't they do like a, a pickup truck or something too? Yeah, like a Jeep, did? which, you know – you know, A Jeep? Feature. Maybe that was in the Turkish Superman movie. I'm not a sure. Jeep. But, He's trying to blend in. Yeah. He's trying to, you know, He's a regular drive. people like you and me. He drinks his coffee in a container. Yeah, he's driving a Jeep to work? Come on. Now, uh, um, I would just like to redo that Wonder Woman thing for a second. Sure, fine. They put Linda Carter's face on the box for the first run, but then Migo was told they had to pay her for her likeness for that. So okay. Migo just yanked it off, and uh, it sold just as well without her face on the box. What about her box? <sighs> Sorry, you have to edit that. Yeah. Um, so, okay, there you go. There is a there is a Cliff Notes version of all the excitement, wackiness, zaniness, insanity, sexiness that was going on in the seventies. Bandex. Bandex that was going on in the seventies for um, for superheroes, uh, Marvel and DC. Wrapping up, let's do a quick little uh, little little rundown like we did in um, in the James Bond episode. Sure. Favorite uh, superhero TV theme from the 70s? Mike Post's Captain America 2. Come on! Love it! Who even knows what the hell that is? It it is a really good... It's a Mike Post theme, you know, Simon and Simon. Like, it's a wasted bit of genius. I love that theme. Mike Post's theme for the second Captain America TV movie. Bit obscure, understand... Well, I'm going with Wonder Woman. I'm sorry. It is, it is a brilliant theme tune. The lyrics are pure is shapes. Charles, is that Charles Fox? I don't know. Yeah, that's a, sounds that's like a question. Charles Fox. I don't know. Uh, favorite bit of 70s superhero toy merchandise? Oh, my God. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, my ta- <laughs> amigo talking Spider-Man Super Softy that I got when I was five. Nice says I'll get you Green Goblin. I am going to go uh, it's it's a it's a um, it's two in one answer and I'm sorry if you don't like it but these are my rules. All right. It's the uh, the Spider-Man web shooter, the the blue plastic one that shoots the suction dart by fun stuff. By fun stuff. Man, I must have had that at two or three different times. Whenever I broke it, I had to get a new one. And there was also a Hulk Flying Fist and a yeah. Captain America Flying Shield. All right, I thought it was by Fun Stuff or Durham. Uh, now I'm getting now I'm getting mixed I think up. I think it might be Durham. D E R H A M. I've got one loose and I've got one carded, uh, and it, they came in different packaging. A couple yeah, of different they, ways. They, they ran them for a couple of years. Yeah. I just just 
love every centimeter of that thing. And the other thing is the one, the Spidey uh, web maker thing. Chemtoy. That came in a kit with the tiny little figures. Yep. And the little backdrop of um, the city with the Daily Bugle and all that, uh, all that jazz. True story. You know how I got mine? No idea. My dad came back from 1978 Toy Fair with it. Oh, right. But said, didn't something happen because you, um, you got the chemicals on the furniture or something? No, no. I just wrecked it in one day. It was fine. Second? Yeah. It, it didn't survive a day's play. No, it was it was. Um, but wasn't it also kind of you know the chemicals were kind of hinky too? Um, yeah, it was sort of like airplane glue. I loved it. I mean, I absolutely loved it, and I put it in rack toys just because you know it's it's a genius toy. Favorite um, superhero of the seventies? I would have to go with Captain America again. I was and with with a second one of Shazam. I was really big into Captain Marvel too. You know, so you're going to say the Captain America TV movies? Yeah, I because I was so into that character. I love I love Nicholas Hammond Spider Man. I, you know, but um, you know that was that was you know it's, that was my favorite. So that was like really awesome to see Captain America, even though it was hinky and and not so great. I just I thought it was awesome to see him on screen as a kid. So. Yeah, you know I'm gonna have to probably go with that too because it was it was like a jaw dropping moment. Like yeah. oh my gosh, we're getting. I didn't think this would ever happen. I mean, even as a little kid, you were kind of like, oh, my gosh, we're getting Spider-Man? Like, how are they doing this? Yeah. It was really... Um, but they really- tried, they, you know, they grounded the Incredible Hulk in a lot of reality. Yes. And then they grounded Spidey in a lot of reality. You know, his origin's kind of crappy. Captain America, there's a lot more sci-fi going on in that. They can't, you know, he is a guy driving around in spandex being a superhero. So I, I think mm. that's one of the things that I glommed to as a kid is like, Look at that cool bike he has, and you know yeah, he's, yeah, yeah. He's, he's fighting crime. Uh, you know? And also, we should tell everybody that you you were part of. Well, two quick things at the end. I keep saying two quick things, yeah. but we never finish. Uh, w- low point. What's your what's your low point for '70s superheroes? Oh boy, um, probably Legends of the Superheroes. It's got to be right. Yeah, it's so. It's just so. It's it has such a contempt. And you know, it, you know how every newspaper article for 20 years would, t- when they talked about comic books or for adults, it would go pow, biff, bang, zap. Yeah. You know, the the, the 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 Legend of the Superheroes is definitely one of those things that did it. It's not to say I don't appreciate it now, <laughs> but it really is a low point. But it's also the the the, the I mean, it's when it's difficult to describe. <laughs> Yeah, severity of how awful this thing is. When I have a hard time finding the words, you know this is this yeah. is bad. Yeah. But it is one of those things that's like, it's beyond train wreck into one of those like Robert Stack hosted unsolved mysteries shows. Like, how did this happen? Yeah. Like, what what is the answer? How did this thing happen? But for those of you um, that Doug, what we're talking about, um, and you're here, so I'd imagine that you did. Otherwise, why, what are you doing here? There's a great book called Age of TV Heroes um, by Jason Hofius and George Curry. Uh, beautiful cover by Alex Ross uh, that you can – I think I just checked it out on Amazon and it's on back order. But it's, it's not out of print. You can still find the thing. But also, you did something really cool. You were part of that project. Um, what would we call it? The, the, the 70s catalog of toys that might have been. Oh, right. Now, I didn't, you know, I was mainly the publisher of that. But, yeah, the Mego Museum, all the customizers did a thing called 1978 Reimagined. Yeah. And one customizer, uh, you know, it, what it was was a fantasy Mego catalog that you can still buy. Um, <laughs> Tell the you folks. Know, the, what if you, you get it at the Mego Museum dot com. Okay. Um, it, it was basically... What if? What if you could? Um, what if Mego had Star Wars? What if Mego had the '66 Batman series? What if Mego had the Universal Monsters? And one clever guy, and he's actually heading up a, a sequel to it called 1983, right cool. now. Uh, he did Reb Brown as Captain America, Lou Ferrigno as the Hulk. Yeah. I don't remember if he did, uh, but anyways, it doesn't matter. They, they were brilliant. And it's it was really a, neat. It's a neat little. It's a neat little side project that I was happy to be involved with. Um, and it's cool to see an eight-inch Mego style um, 
Captain America with yeah. the shield and everything. It's and the, and the, it's it's really cool to see that. So uh, I and urge, he did a Bonnie job. Like it's really well done. So yeah. So I urge everyone to run run over to Amigo Museum to, to grab a copy of that because it's super cool. But My on that note, that you. is finally that the, is finally it. That's it. That's all I got. So uh, until next time, I'm Brian. And I'm Jason. And keep watching the skies. I don't know what to say here. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you. Thank you.